Welcome. Welcome to worship at First Baptist Church of Decatur this, the third Sunday of Advent. During these four weeks prior to Christmas, we are joining with the ancient people of Israel in our longing for Messiah to come and be present in our lives. We do as the prophet called us. We clear a straight path in our hearts for him to come. This is the Sunday in which we celebrate the joy of the coming of Christ. And so though we are each in our own homes, we come together joyfully in spirit this day as we worship. Come, Emmanuel, God be with us as we worship today. When the sun rises, what shall we sing? My soul magnifies the Lord. 
And when chaos and violence echo on the screen, my soul magnifies the Lord. For our God is a God of justice and peace. My soul magnifies the Lord. So when all is wrong or all is right, my soul magnifies the Lord. We light the candle of joy to remind us that darkness does not have the last word. May this light guide and inspire us as we work to spread God's joy and delight through this world. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from the book of John, chapter 1, verses 19 to 23. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask them, who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Thanks be to God. Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 15 through 22. See that none of you repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our God, in your divine mercy and by your grace, hear our prayer today. 
We come to you today in worship and in celebration on this third Sunday of Advent, knowing that you are the source of all joy. All that we can name in our lives that is good comes from your hand, down to us from the Father of lights. You have given us the joy of our salvation, the joy of your presence with us. And even in this year of pandemic, the joy of our eternal hope in you. We ask that you continue to shape and form us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, whose coming we celebrate this season of the year. As followers of Christ, we want to be like him in our demeanor, in all of our relationships, and in the very essence of our lives, caring for the poor and lonely, reaching out to the outcast, being his hands, his feet, his heart, his voice in the world. Forgive us, Lord, when we fail to do these things, when we let the cares and the stresses of our lives cause us to be less than Christ-like with others, and we fail to portray the image of your Son to the world. These have been difficult days, dear Lord, very difficult for so many. May your healing grace be upon all who suffer, especially in this season of the year be it the recent death of a loved one, serious illness or health concerns, possibly the loss of a job or income, those who are lonely, those who are separated from their loved ones this holiday season, whatever the concerns of our hearts and minds, Lord, we know you know it already. And you stand ready to bless us with your sustaining presence by the sacred reminders you send our way, the beauty of your creation, your holy word which broadcast your hope and your joy and your love to the world through our relationships with those who love us dearly and through the ministry and compassion of this church. We do ask your blessings upon this church that we may be a shining light for Christ in this community and beyond. Fill us with your goodness and may your goodness shine forth through all that we do in spoken word, in worship shared, in ministry given to those who need you. May your grace and peace now overflow in our hearts and with all that we encounter this week. It is in the name of Christ, the one who was and is and who is to come, that we pray this day. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Isaiah 40, verses 9 12 and 13 and 21 and 22. Hear now the reading from the prophet of the Lord. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span? Enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in balance? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has instructed him? Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in. 
Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We are called to gaze outward, to look inward, and to move onward. Our two primary passages for today ask the question, who are you really? And to get at that answer or that series of answers, we're called to gaze outward, look inward, and move onward. Isaiah 40, we talked about last week. And as a reminder, this is a passage that, while incredibly poetic, lyrical, and beautiful, it also can be a little depressing in a way. Because last week, as we said, it begins with this idea of uh, comparing us with the grass and the flowers. The flowers fade and the grass withers. And we're like, in fact, Isaiah says, you are the grass and the flowers. You wither, you fade, we fall away and the earth remembers us no more. It continues on, the way the passage really works is so valuable in offering perspective on, first of all, the greatness of God and the tiny minuscule aspects of our humanity, our humanness in comparison to God's greatness. Listen to the way the passage unfolds. First of all, the, the call to joy, remember this week as a progression through Advent, is the lighting of the candle of joy. And in the context of this kind of depressing picture of our humanness over against God's greatness, it calls us to get up on a high mountain and call out to the creation that surrounds and be a herald of good tidings and good news in the New Testament. This is called the Evangelion, or the, the good news of the gospel in the Hebrew scriptures. This is the call. Get up on the mountain and, and, and cry out. Call the good news of glad tidings of God's greatness. In this case, the liberation of the Judean people from their bondage and exile. But it's also kind of casting this vision of the broader context of creation. Listen to the way it unfolds. After we're told to go up, or the people are told to go up on a mountain and, and, and cry out the glad tidings of this good news, then the question comes, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Have you? Who are you really? God is great, and you're not. Who has enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure? And who has weighed the mountains on scales? And who has put the hills in a balance? Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or who has been counselor and instructed God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the very beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is God who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. God who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to live in. In other words, God is great and we are not. In fact, we are like grasshoppers. We are like grass. We are like flowers. We may bloom for a day, but we wither and die. We are tiny. We are minuscule. We are exceedingly human, and God is great. This is the, the vision that Isaiah is casting in this gazing outward. I love the word gaze. It's to look steadily and intently, especially in admiration and surprise. We are to gaze outward, says Isaiah. We're to look at this broad universe, this incredible creation that God has placed for us and put us in. We are to recognize, remembering Genesis and that second creation story in chapter 2, where God lifts out of the dust of the earth and shapes a human form. 
We are like dirt. We are like dust of the earth. We are created from the dust of the earth. And yet, we are intimately connected to the greatness of God because God blows the Spirit. God's Spirit lives within us. We are, our breath is connected to the wind, the breath, the Spirit of God. Isaiah brings all this together, casting out this, this, this vision to gaze outward with wonder on the greatness of God and recognizing our part in this broader creation, we are pretty small and God is mighty great. Gazing outward then allows us to have a context for our humanity, while at the same time, with this broader question, who are you really? We are given other stuff to work with. Before we move to our next passage in the Gospel of John, let me just say one more piece of the puzzle from the beautiful words of Isaiah 40. Notice there is hidden within this passage uh, a little hint about the worldview and kind of the actually more sophistication of these folks than we sometimes give them credit. Sometimes in classes I like to ask uh, students and, and participants in my classes and Bible studies, what do you think the people of, say, the Old Testament and the New Testament times knew about the shape of the world? Most people will say, thinking of uh, their our, our limited knowledge about biblical times and the way people thought, and uh, Columbus sometimes will enter into our minds, well, they thought the earth was flat. They didn't know much at all. They just had a real limited understanding of geography and the way things worked. In fact, if you listen carefully to Isaiah chapter 40, we get this little tidbit of wisdom and get a little window into the fact that they were a little more sophisticated than we sometimes recognize. Uh, it is God who sits above the circle of the earth. They knew the earth was round. They knew a lot more about the earth than we sometimes recognize. These were pretty smart people, pretty sophisticated. In fact, uh, Isaiah is probably be probably being written uh, in the mid-500s BC. By 200 BC, a guy in Alexandria by the name of Eratosthenes, not only was he aware, as everybody was, most people in those days, that the earth was round, but Eratosthenes uh, figured out the actual size of the earth. He came within about 400 miles of determining the actual size of that circle. The earth is roughly 25,000 miles around, and Eratosthenes in 200 BC figured out through a very complex and remarkable series of, of um, geometrical uh, figurings what the actual size of the earth was. 200 BC, amazing. The time of Isaiah, they didn't quite know the size of the earth, but they knew the shape of the earth, the circle of the earth, and they knew the greatness of God in the context of this broader creation. Well, Isaiah 40 presents us with this challenge to, to gaze outward with wonder and with awe in the context of figuring out who are you really? Well, Isaiah wants us to know we're pretty small and God is mighty big. God is great and we are not. Who are we really? We're also called from the, the, the um, first chapter of John to consider what we learn about John the Baptist. These religious leaders in this chapter have been sent to talk to John the Baptist and in contrast to Isaiah, where in the 40th chapter we're called to gaze outward and wonder, in the first chapter of John, we're called to look inward with introspection. And here's how this works. These religious leaders are, are sent to John the Baptist, and they're saying, who are you really? 
are you the Messiah? And John the Baptist responds immediately, no, I'm, I'm not the Messiah. Are you Elijah? No, I'm not Elijah, John the Baptist says. Are you a prophet? Anybody special at all? And John the Baptist says, no, I'm not. So they say, well, who are you really? We've been sent to find out who you are and what it is you're doing. Who are you really? And John the Baptist's reply is very important. He simply quotes from Isaiah chapter 40. And he says, I'm a voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. In other words, John knows who he's not. He's very clear on who he's not. And he's also very clear on who he is. A great lesson for you and me to gaze outward in wonder and see ourselves in the broader context of the universe and God's magnificent creation and to look inward and to ask ourselves, like John on his journey of faith, who am I really? He knew who he was not, and he knew who he was. This is a very important word for our day. In these tough times, these strange times, it's really valuable to pause for a moment to ponder on who am I really, to look inward. And sometimes the best way of discovering ourselves is sadly through those times in our lives when we have failed. I became really good at this my eighth grade year at Signal Mountain Junior High School. In those days, we didn't have middle school. We had junior high school where it was seventh, eighth, and ninth graders together. My eighth grade year, I was on the varsity basketball team of Signal Mountain Junior High School. And that year we went 0 and 13. We became very good at losing. In fact, there were people in our town that called us just a bunch of losers. Failure was just a part of our shtick. And tragically, we had some decent players on the team. And there were a few times during that season where we actually should have and could have won a few of the games that we ended up losing. But somehow we became so accustomed to failure that even those games we should have and could have won, we ended up losing. Now, the good news about that bad, bad season and the failures and losses of that season was for those of us who were eighth graders, we went on our ninth grade year realizing that losing was just not any fun. And we really made it our, our uh, priority to work hard in the off season, to perfect our skills, to work better as a team, so that our ninth grade year was much better. We still had a few losses, but we had a lot of wins, and we also had a lot of fun. What we learn, of course, early on, whether it's through athletics or, or music or anything that we try to do that has the potential of failure, what we learn, of course, is that when we lose or when we fail, there is something redemptive about that. There's something good about that because we always learn something about ourselves when we win and when we lose. But often when we lose, we learn even more. We learn about character. In fact, honestly, that eighth grade year when we were 0 and 13 in basketball, I frankly got sick and tired about people saying to me, oh, well, you're really building character this year. Yes and we got sick and tired of building character. There is something about failure and losing that indeed builds character, but you can only take so much of that. The positive thing, of course, in the broader life lesson is that to be able to win humbly and lose gracefully with wisdom and maturity is really important in all of our lives in developing wisdom and maturity. It's a biblical thing to take losses like the exile, for example, that Isaiah 40 is preaching and prophesying 
out of, that context of horrible failure and horrible loss. And yet the people are called to learn important life and faith lessons out of that tragedy and loss. A friend of mine not, not long ago uh, went through a series of interviews and there was, a, there was one particular interview where he was just sure that he had the job and, and everything was gonna go well and he was all excited, only to find out a couple of weeks later that the job he had interviewed for had been given to somebody else. He was devastated. In fact, he was furious because he felt like the, the, the committee had uh, asked some questions that he wasn't quite as prepared for. Uh, he felt like there were things that were uh, going on in the politics that probably weren't quite right and, and he deserved that position more than the person that they ultimately hired. A few weeks later in a uh, conversation, he had a different take on what had happened and his role in that loss of not getting the job. He was more philosophical and was able to say with perspective, you know, I didn't prepare for that interview like I should have. I could have done better. I should have done better. I learned a valuable lesson. Of course, most of us with perspective in life realize that out of those defeats, out of failures, we find it important, it's very biblical in fact, to step back and say, well, there may have been circumstances that I couldn't control. There may have been some things that other people did that weren't right or weren't fair, but we need to ask ourselves in our failures and our losses, what was it that I did that contributed to that lack of win? What could I have done better in bringing about a victory instead of a defeat? What was it that I said that wasn't quite right? What did I do that could have been done better? How could I have been more prepared? All these questions really are a part of this larger question. Who are you really? Because God is working with all of us and teaching all of us through the good times and the bad times. Through those years when all is going well and things are, are just happy-go-lucky and through years where there is pandemic and economic difficulty and uncertainty and divisiveness and all the things that have been accompanying this crazy year of 2020. Isaiah 40 and John 1 really call on us within this broader question of who are you really? Who has God made you? But the broader question to, to gaze outward with wonder with this question of who are you really? And to be able to look inward with a real sense of introspection and honesty. What could I have done better? What do I need to improve? How is God teaching me through these trials and tribulations? What is it that I need to be more adept at and more open to and more ready for? We look inward, we gaze outward, and finally, we're called to move onward. In both Isaiah and in John, there was real transition taking place. In John's case, John the Baptist was a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. John was willing to live his whole life, not so much for himself, but rather to live his life bringing others and opening up others to Jesus, to help others facilitate in their lives a connecting point of holiness and sacredness where they can be ready to welcome Jesus into their lives. We're called to move onward, to not get stuck in feeling sorry for ourselves or blaming other people or being angry at the world around us, but instead to move onward with grace and dignity and integrity and to recognize that sometimes things happen that we wish had not happened. Sometimes things could have and should have been better. Sometimes the role that I could have or should have played is 
different. I could have done better. I should have done better. Instead of wallowing in self-pity or blaming others, it's time we move onward with grace and dignity and integrity, especially in this season of Advent, to be able to, to gaze outward and truly give God thanks and proclaim the good news. Behold, your God. Behold, God's beautiful creation. To look inward and to really become more clear who we're not and to become more clear who we are. To recognize that in spite of all the hardships and difficulties, life is good. That people are important and most of all that God is great and we are not. And yet, God has infused in us the very spirit of sacredness, God's own spirit in us, animating us and allowing us to participate fully in God's holiness and sacredness and mystery. We're to move onward from this time of difficulty and hold all these things in perspective. In doing so, I'd like to share with you in closing a, a poem. Many of you know that my mother is a hymn writer, a musician, She's also a poet and has composed this poem I'd like to share with us as we consider the value of gazing outward, looking inward, and moving onward. Her poem is entitled Pandemic Christmas, written especially for right here and right now. Though Christmas is strange in this pandemic year, Let's pause to remember our reason for cheer, for though things are different, it's good to recall the very first Christmas began in a stall. Our gatherings are risky, germs, they, they spread, but think of our Lord in his cold manger bed and Herod's wild fury that caused them to flee. So what if our loved ones can't be round our tree? We can't have a crowd for our rich table food, but Jesus was born in a poor stable, crude. Though home may feel empty, no reason to fuss. God emptied himself to become one of us. So let's voice our praises. Let's sing and be glad. Let's pray for those mourning and reach out to the sad. Give thanks to the Father and thanks to the Son and thanks to the Spirit, the blessed three in one. We are not alone. We have no need to fear. For Jesus has said we should be of good cheer. This pandemic Christmas reminds us again, God came to be with us. Amen and amen. Brothers and sisters, let us gaze outward with wonder this Advent season. Let us look inward with introspection and honesty. And let us move onward, recognizing that this week we burn the candle of joy and can, with all this new perspective and gratitude, be filled with God's Spirit and truly live out the candle of joy. Behold your God and the glory of God's creation. Thanks be to God. Amen. You step down from heaven Humbly you came Lord of all creation with us in a startling manger Emmanuel light of the world here with us adore come let us adore
the Lord Worship Christ the Lord Let all that is within us Adore Wise men bring their treasures Shepherds bow low Angels voices sing of peace on earth What have I to offer To heaven's king As we continue to journey through Advent together and you go about the week ahead, my prayer is that you would be people of joy. Let joy live in your heart and share the joy of Christ with all you meet. Share joy by seeing the good in each other. Share joy by remembering good times and hoping for good times to come. Share joy by praying for our world. In this Advent season, we need to see, feel, and share joy. As you go out into the wonder of God's creation, share joy, peace, and hope with those you meet. Amen.